Again, if you have a bulletin in front of you or you happen to be online, I invite you to share as we read a word of God from the Gospel of Matthew. But this is a section of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus shared with those who were following him. Chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. And the theme is loving your enemies. And to spice things up a little bit this morning, I've selected a translation from a familiar Bible that we've read from before in our church, Eugene Peterson. Imagine this man so struck by the power of the Word of God that he spent his adult years translating God's Word into the vernacular of our day, of our time. And so we hear Matthew 5 from a translation of the Bible called The Message. Friends, here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose, says Jesus. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. But I'm challenging, I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. And when someone gives you a hard time, Respond with the energies of prayer, for then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. God gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, what do you expect, a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. May the Lord bless to our understanding these words from this sacred story. Amen. And friends, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, O God, be acceptable with you in this time of my preaching and our hearing, a word of inspiration for our living. Amen. I want to share with you a story that comes from Isabel Wilkerson's book. It's a story I happened to read in a sermon that Martin Luther King preached on July 4th, 1965, I believe, 1965. It was his July 4th sermon. Wilkerson writes, 
In the early winter of 1959, after leading the Montgomery bus boycott that arose from the arrest of Rosa Parks and before the trials and triumphs to come, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta landed in India, in the city then known as Bombay, to visit the land of Mahatma K. Gandhi, the former, the father of nonviolent protest. They were covered in garlands upon arrival, and King told reporters, to other countries I may go as a tourist, but to India I come as a pilgrim. King had long dreamed of going to India, and they stayed in India for more than a month, welcomed by Prime Minister Nehru. King wanted to see for himself the place whose fight for freedom from British rule had inspired his fight for justice in America. King wanted to see the so-called untouchables, the lowest caste in the ancient Indian caste system, whom King had read of and had sympathy for, and who were left behind after India gained its independence one decade before. He discovered that people in India had been following the trials of his own oppressed people in America. They knew of the bus boycott that he led. And wherever King went, people on the streets of Bombay and Delhi crowded around him for an autograph. And one afternoon, King and his wife journeyed to the southern tip of the country to the city, then known as Trivandrum, in the state of Kerala, and visited with high school students whose families had been untouchables. The principal made the introduction. Young people, he said, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. King was floored. He had not expected that word to be applied to him. He was, in fact, put off by it at first. He had flown in from another continent, had dined with the prime minister. He did not see the connection, did not see what the Indian caste system had to do directly with him. He did not immediately see why the lowest caste people in India would view him, an American Negro and a distinguished visitor, as low caste-like themselves. See him as one of them. For a moment, Martin Luther King would later recall, for a moment I was a bit shocked and peeved that I would be referred to as an untouchable. And then he began to think about the reality of the lives of the people he was fighting for. 20 million people back in 1959 consigned to the lowest rank in America for centuries, still smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, quarantined in isolated ghettos, exiled in their own country. And he said to himself, yes, I am an untouchable, and every Negro in the United States of America is an untouchable. And in that moment, he realized that the land of the free had imposed a caste system, not unlike the caste system of India, and that he had lived under that system all of his life. It was what lay beneath the forces he was fighting in America. He would later describe this awakening at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, in that 1965 sermon delivered on the 4th of July. This story is retold by Isabel Wilkerson in her soon-to-be-published book. Not that long ago, she writes, we saw a man face down on the pavement, pinned beneath a car, 
and above him another man, a man in a uniform, his skin lighter than the man on the ground, and the lighter man was bearing down on the darker man, his knee boring into the neck of the darker man, the lighter man's hands at his sides in his pockets. Could it be that his hands were so nonchalantly in his pockets? Such was the ease and casual calm, the confidence of embedded entitlement with which he was able to lord over the darker man. We heard the man on the ground pleading with the man above him, saw the terror in his face, heard his gasps for air, heard the anguished cries of an unseen chorus begging the lighter man to stop. But the lighter man, the dominant man, looked straight at the bystanders into the camera and thus at all of us around the world who would later bear witness and instead of heeding the cries of the chorus, pressed his knee deeper into the darker man's neck as was the perceived right granted him in the hierarchy. The man on the ground went silent, drained of breath. A clear liquid crept down the pavement. We saw a man die before our very eyes. What we did not see Wilkerson writes, not immediately anyway, was the invisible scaffolding, the caste system with ancient rules and assumptions that made such a horror possible, that held each actor in that scene in its grip. Thus are the times in which we live, in which we find ourselves gathering for worship on this July 5th, 2020. My difficulties with fireworks started many years ago. I read about the siege of Sarajevo, the former Yugoslavia, when one group was launching rockets into the center of the city for month after month after month. And would-be assassins stood at a higher altitude firing at people looking for food and water. And I remember hearing about and thinking about and the lights turning on in my own life about how incredibly violent that geography was and how incredibly ear-breaking, eardrum-breaking those rocket-propelled grenades were. I remember at that time, I don't like fireworks. I don't like the sound. Of course, that was before so many heroic troops came back from nations like Iraq and Afghanistan, and of course, from those conflicts before then. But my hatred of fireworks continued when I went to Honduras with John Ludwig, and some of you remember John Ludwig, and John invited his son a soldier home with PTSD to join us on this trip to Honduras. That was my first experience living with someone with acute PTSD. We were out at an outdoor restaurant and fireworks started from about seven to 10 blocks away and John's son visibly changed. Not just a little, but fearfully. 
So much so that I went and tried to find who was setting off those fireworks. I was unsuccessful, but I did learn that they were setting off fireworks to celebrate the founding of the nation many years earlier. But I will never ever forget how scared John was for his son. And I will never listen to these words of our national anthem again the same way, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. Today, my friends, more than ever, I have a hard time with carte blanche patriotism, unchecked patriotism, too much patriotism. And I think you know what I'm talking about, those flyovers at NFL stadiums and all of the glorification of fighting that are marketed in so many ways to our nation's youngest. The way we've given a blank check to the military industrial complex as if they need to protect us from a foreign enemy at no cost. I am a patriot and I agree with Winston Churchill what he said that there's no form of government better than a democracy. But I also hear the words of Vincent Harding, which some of you may have heard this morning. Is America possible? Is America possible? I'm not much of a historian, but dare I say, another great awakening is upon us. And at the core of this awakening is the discovery of the difference between fact and fiction, myth and reality, justice and injustice on our streets and across our land. The point that we need to understand is that there are invisible structures in and supporting our nation's house. What's behind the wallpaper? What's behind the sheetrock? These invisible structures that serve to separate people by the color of their skin and perpetuate a horrifically unjust system. One in which white folk with backgrounds such as mine uncritically perpetuate a set of laws which favor other white people. Un mistakably. Yes, a great awakening may be beginning and a search for that answer to the question, is America possible underway? I am a patriot and don't get me wrong, there have been wonderful and there continue to be wonderful moments that buoy my spirits and give me hope. Many things happen in this nation that happen nowhere else. Those of you who have been a part of this community for a long time know what it means to welcome the stranger and to see a foreigner welcomed into this church and given hope. Folk from war-torn countries, many of which are started by our foreign policy, amazingly wind up on these shores in this city of Lowell looking for hope. Oh, there are many hopeful moments. But I think this great awakening is calling us who are paying attention and who really want to follow Jesus to ask this question posed earlier this week by a new professor, Kendi at Boston University. Kendi Ebram, he says, it's not enough to say I am not racist. It's important for us to understand what it means to be anti-racist. And to summons from deep within this conviction, this energy, this desire to speak out lovingly against a system, a caste system, 
that segregate, segregates and separates, suppresses and oppresses persons of color. As I was thinking about this sermon this week, I thought, this is why Jesus was crucified. This is why the one who gathers us on Sunday morning to worship was crucified. Because Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now, Jesus said. Martin Luther King took from Jesus that promise and called it the beloved community. The beloved community is now the great awakening that might be just beginning, this great reversal that might just be beginning, this great opening, this great opportunity that is before us this Independence Day weekend is one we cannot afford to close our eyes to. Because I think this is a hopeful moment for all of us, and you to whom I am preaching know this. In Lent, we studied James Cone, the cross and the lynching tree. And there are so many paragraphs from his book that we studied that could be apropos right now, but I want to share just one. We cannot find liberating joy, we brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We cannot find liberating joy in the cross by spiritualizing it, by taking away its message of justice in the midst of powerlessness, suffering, and death. That does a disservice to the cross. The cross as the locus of divine revelation is not good news for the powerful. Did you hear that? The cross is not good news. Let me repeat that. The cross as a locus of divine revelation is not good news for the powerful, for those who are uncomfortable with the way things are, or for anyone whose understanding of religion is aligned with power. No, we need to reorient our understanding of what Jesus meant when he said the kingdom of God is now. We need to reorient our understanding and find more strength in this cross that symbolizes so much, including God's victory over death and God's victory over all those who peddle death. We have this cross in Jesus rising from the tomb. We have a story, a hope that sustains a way forward, a great awakening in these extremely challenging times. And so the awakening continues within as we pledge our allegiance to following Jesus. I loved Eugene Peterson's translation of Matthew. That last verse, which I know you can't remember, can't forget, reads again as follows. He says Jesus is saying this. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up, become mature persons of faith. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. And so in this Pentecost season, we've been discussing that first Christian community and how they were possessed. Possessed to grow up. Possessed by God's love to grow up. That rush of a mighty wind, that holy wind which ushered them from that upper room out into the world with great hope and conviction. Yes, we've been trying to emulate, trying to think about what it means to be living in that spirit of the way those first Christians in this season of Pentecost. And I, again, don't dare minimizing the struggle that so many of us are facing. It has not been easy to be a part 
We are all becoming more or less exhausted and confused and uncertain about this pandemic and how long it's going to last and how are we to behave. And the protests begun after Floyd's murder, yet which speak of the reality for so many. That we've got some serious house repairs to do. It's unlikely that we as a people over the past few months have experienced such a season packed both with trauma and hope. Massive suffering from a pandemic, the revelatory incidents of police brutality, but also numerous, previously unimaginable, however incremental steps toward addressing systemic racism. Could this be a time of great awakening? In a word, Jesus is saying to you and to me, grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Amen.